Hello and welcome everyone from the League of Women Voters of Bellingham and Whatcom County. The League of Women Voters was created 100 years ago, six months before the passage of the 19th Amendment. It was founded with the intention of helping to prepare women to not just cast votes, but to make sure that the votes that they cast were educated votes. Yeah. Then, as today, the League does not support any political party or endorse candidates. Instead, we educate ourselves and the voting public about the issues that affect our community, our state, our nation, our world, and after careful study, we advocate for positions on those issues at every opportunity. Our members are women and men who care about those issues and are prepared to work in advocacy. To find out more about the League, our work, and how you can join, check out our website at the League of Women Voters, bellinghamwatcom.org. In 2020, we've been celebrating the centennial anniversaries of the founding of the League and the passage of the 19th Amendment. And we have had some fun in honoring these important milestones, but milestones they are on a journey towards a more perfect democracy. While the passage of the 19th Amendment permitted women to vote, it did not ensure that all would have access to the ballot. Everyone here is well aware that voter suppression and obstacles to voting continue to plague our country. So while we here at the League of Women Voters in Bellingham and Whatcom County have been hard at work to do our part to ready everyone for the election, registering voters, hosting candidate forums, informing on the issues, we also want to help to dig deeper into this country's history to understand the continuing barriers to the ballot and those things that will continue to crowd out some voices and amplify others. This series towards a more perfect democracy is being launched tonight with pride by the League in an effort to examine the difficult work that has been done to bring full civil rights and the vote to all in our country and the work that lies ahead to bring us closer to our democratic ideals. Next Thursday will be the second in this series. I expect that these two discussions will provide an excellent opportunity for all of us to dig deeper, to know more, to find out more about our history and the work that we can all do to bring that more perfect democracy. The only thing that makes me a little bit unhappy about the launch of this outstanding program is that the planning is now complete. And this makes me sad because of how very much I have enjoyed working with the League's partners at the City of Bellingham, the Whatcom Museum, at Whatcom Community College, at Western Washington University, and at the Ralph Monroe Institute. Each of these partners have been working to do everything they can to bring the very best speakers, the very best information, and to create a truly special opportunity to shine a bright light on where we have been and where we need to go on that journey towards a more perfect democracy. I want, to I want to say thank you to all of our partners, but a very special thank you to the museum and a, and a deep um, well of gratitude is owed to the Ralph Monroe Institute. You have been remarkable partners and we at the League of Women Voters are really most sincerely grateful. Now I would like to introduce the executive director of the Ralph Monroe Institute, Dr. Damani Johnson, mm -hmm. Professor of Political Science, this year's winner of the Rosemary and Howard Harris Lifetime Peacemaker Award from the Whatcom Peace and Justice Center, and a dynamic, important community leader. So welcome to all of the attendees and uh, welcome to you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for that uh, nice little introduction, Jill. And uh, before we go any further, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin here and throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascades watershed uh, since time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Lummi Nation and the Nooksack tribe for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. When Jill Bernstein approached me now more than a year ago to inquire about the possibility of the Monroe Institute co-sponsoring the League's commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment, I thought for a few seconds 
before I consented. From my time in league circles, my, my wife, Rebecca, is a, a, a past president of the local league chapter. From my time in those circles, I was aware of Jill's formidable powers of persuasion. So I quickly said yes before the wrenching pain of my twisted arm could be experienced. Seriously though, it was an easy call. The Monroe Institute is committed to civic education. This means offering programming that reaches beyond the university campus, collaborating with organizations like the League of Women Voters who have deep roots in the community affords the Monroe Institute an excellent opportunity to live out its mission. So we're thrilled to be a part of these rescheduled conversations on the continuing quest for a more perfect union. Jill, Judy, Annette, uh, I'll miss the coffees at the crack of dawn, but we'll have to work it in uh, at a more civilized time uh, when we can meet again in real time uh, sometime in the near future. Let me thank uh, the political science department of Western Washington University and our chair, Amir Betty, uh, for continuing uh, their support for the Institute. And a special thanks to Professor Vicki Schroy, um, who's uh, along with Professor Dessler, uh, uh, they're members of the uh, Monroe Institute Advisory Committee because uh, Vicki and, and Kate were also at those early morning coffees um, on many occasions. Uh, and before I forget it, there is one house, housekeeping matter. And that is, if you have questions, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and uh, we'll get those questions to our moderator. Um, and uh, we won't probably be able to get to all of them, but as time permits, we will get to as many of them as possible. Now, let me um, introduce tonight's moderator, uh, Professor Catherine Dessler. Uh, Kate is an associate professor of political science here at Western Washington University. Her teaching and research interests include uh, education policy, civic engagement, public management, and the relationship between formal policy and values, norms, and behavior. She has published research in the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory, International Public Management Journal, the American Review of Public Administration, and Economics of Education Review. Uh, she was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship from the National Academy of Education and the Spencer Foundation to examine the links between increased school choice and stratification by race and income. She has also written for and consulted with practitioners, including the Seattle Public Schools. A former middle school and high school English teacher, Dessler holds uh, an AB in comparative literature from Brown University an MAT from the University of Virginia, and a PhD in public policy and management from the University of Washington. Please welcome Professor Kate Dessler. Thank you so much, Damani. Thank you, Jill. And I just, I, I don't want to belabor this point, but I wanna to say to how much this conversation, this partnership has been really meaningful when Damani said, hey, do you wanna go have, have a cup of coffee with some folks from the league. I didn't have any idea really what I was getting into, but it's been a really fantastic experience. And I hope the partnerships will continue. It is really a distinct pleasure and honor to facilitate tonight's conversation. I think it's worth noting that this was a conversation, not only that we started planning a year ago, but that we thought was going to begin approximately eight months ago, um, really right on the cusp of COVID and the way in which it's disrupted all of our lives. So I wanna thank the panelists for their flexibility and rearranging their schedule. And I wanna thank all of you who are here in the audience for coming in a context that is not what we envisioned, but I think has a real opportunity for fantastic conversation. We have a really exciting panel tonight with four distinguished guests who have spanned both sort of academic knowledge and practice. And I'm really, really, I want to sort of acknowledge the gifts that all of them will bring into the conversation. Um, first of all, Marco Morales is a graduate of Western Washington University and Heidelberg University, where he studied first American cultural studies and then political science, history, and law. A lifelong resident of Mount Vernon, Washington, just a little bit south of us, 
Mr. Morales is a critical voice in the community, serving on the City Planning Commission and working in the Mount Vernon schools, supporting students from migrant farm worker backgrounds. He currently also serves as the president of the Indigenous Studies Foundation, and we really look forward to his voice. Professor Christopher Parker is a professor of political science at the University of Washington, where his teaching and research focused on black politics, racial conflict, and social movements. His first book, Fighting for Democracy, Black Veterans in the Struggle Against White Supremacy, won the American Political Science Association's Ralph Bunch Award. More recently, Professor Parker has turned to look at social movements associated with the reactionary right. Two books, Change They Can't Believe In, The Tea Party and Reactionary Politics in America, and Haven't We Seen This Stuff Before? The Reactionary Right and the Origins of a Contemporary Racial Politics, offer fresh and important perspectives on how American politics have been sustained by a resistance to progress and racial progress more specifically. Next, Professor Peter, Peter Pijos is Assistant Professor of History here at Western Washington University, where he teaches courses on African-American history and modern history and brings together expertise not only in history, but in law. He holds a PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania and a JD from the New York University. And before joining us in academia, he served as a clerk for the Honorable Diane P. Wood on the Seventh Circuit Court. Professor Pios's research focuses on race, criminal justice, and urban politics. And he's currently work, working on a book manuscript that examines critical justice reform politics of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s by studying and focusing on Chicago's African-American Patrolman's League. Finally, Brianna Weeder is a Seattle native who grew up immersed in a childhood of civic volunteering and political activism with a commitment to social justice and progressive politics. She's worked for a range of political advocacy organizations and PACs, including Organizing for America and Planned Parenthood, and has managed multiple political campaigns. Currently, Ms. Weeder serves as a policy analyst for Attorney General Bob Ferguson. In her private life, so to speak, or her non-professional life, she remains a a vibrant political figure outside of her work, continuing to serve on PAC boards and volunteering with her local Democratic Party. I want to thank each of them in advance for their comments today and the time that they've devoted to this session. We are so fortunate to have all of their perspectives today. I've, sh I've shared some questions in advance to the panelists, and I'm sure that there's a lot of ground that we can cover in those questions alone. I'm also going to be mindful of what all of you are saying for my goal is really here to facilitate a conversation. So feel free if you want, you know, to the panelists, if there are places where you would like to jump in and add an extra point, I promise I won't mute you as long as you don't talk over your two minutes, so to speak. Um, I think I do have the, actually, I guess none of us have the power to mute, much like Chris Wallace just last week. Um, and to the audience, I want to remind you that we do have this Q&A button. So while you will not be able to deliver questions live to the panel, we really do want to hear your voice. So please share those questions as you think about them. And in the last half hour or so of our panel, we'll, we'll turn to those questions specifically. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the conversation. To start us off, just a very a great, a, a basic, but I think Difficult question. Let me let me remind us, remind the panelists that our focus today, the title of today's panel is Imperfect Democracy. And our focus is on thinking about both contemporary and historical threats to, to voting to political voice in the franchise more broadly. So to first a question, what do you see as the gravest threat to voter enfranchisement in the 2020 election? We're right on the cusp of an election. People are voting as we know, not yet in Washington state, but many places across the country. What do you see? What is the gravest threat that you see right now? What are the roots of that threat and what makes it so important? That's a lot to cover. We'll come back to much of this. So here I'm just asking for a, a couple sentences to get us started and we'll start. I'm going to follow from left to right what I see on my screen. So Peter, will you get us started, please? Sure. Um, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I, I'm so grateful to be part of this conversation. Um, you know, being the historian on the panel, I wanted to kind of give just a deep perspective on this question, which is to say, um, we tend to have a, a understanding of US history that involves the gradual incorporation of, of groups into the vote. And I think um, this uh, progressive understanding of voting rights is 
uh, a bit of a mistake and we should look at today as one in a series of struggles in which um, voting rights that had been previously expanded were narrowed. So we saw this happen um, in the aftermath of reconstruction um, for African-Americans, but we also saw it happen in the urban North and West for immigrants, for example, in a similar period. So, you know, there, there are great threats to voter enfranchisement and this is a real, this is an extraordinary moment in how we're living it, but it is also part of a long history of threatening enfranchisement. Um, you know, it's it's hard to pick, pick one. Um, I think over the last uh, decade and a half, and maybe this isn't a precise answer to 2020, uh, gerrymandering um, has been the greatest threat uh, to American de democracy because um, simply um, it's, it's had an overwhelming influence on um, the ability of candidates to prevail. So, you know, just to give an example from Wisconsin in 2018, um, Democrats won every single statewide office that was on the ballot and yet only won 36 of 99 House seats. They lost the Senate uh, pretty substantially, even though they cast a majority of ballots for um, more ballots for Democratic senators than Republicans. So um, the, the, this is one technique, an indirect technique of gaming the system that I think is extremely grave, though not about Trump. Thank you very much. Bree, what do you see as the gravest threat to enfranchisement right now? Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that Professor just said about just the historic nature of, of voter enfranchisement, where we really are still dealing with a lot of the same problems that we were dealing in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, we don't have a poll tax anymore, but there are states where if you don't have the correct kind of ID, you're not going to be able to vote anyway. Um, even in Washington State, you know, we have one of the most progressive um, ways to turn in your ballot in the country, and yet it still requires a stamp for a lot of people, and that requires money. Um, so there's, we have this idea that we've come so far uh, with full enfranchisement, but we have really are still in a lot of the same places that we were. For me, something I've been really thinking about that's a grave threat to the African American community in particular is felony disenfranchisement. There's only one state in the entire country uh, where you are allowed to vote in jail, but you're allowed to vote if you are a felon and that's Maine. Um, even here in Washington state, you know, Washington state uh, felons are allowed to vote once they've completed their sentence and have paid restitution. Um, but so many people don't know that. Um, a lot of times I actually, when I used to go out and do voter registration, I would spend a lot of time um, telling people that were former felons, that would be like, oh, I can't vote. And I'm like, actually you can. And this is a huge issue. Um, we know that our criminal justice system is racist. It um, disproportionately impacts communities of color, particularly African-American communities. And uh, as states are making it harder for felons to vote, that means it's gonna be harder for low income and black folks to vote. So to me, I think this is a really, really huge issue. And we're seeing it play out in places like Florida to um, have full voter enfranchisement for felons. And now the governor um, is trying not to actually implement that and they're taking it to the courts. So while that's not happening, you know, those people are left in limbo. We have a, an election that's coming up in less than, gosh, 30 days now. Um, so I think this is a huge issue. Thank you. No, and we hear certainly stories people having to pay fines, but not yet know, knowing what the fines are and how much they are and to whom they are owed. Marco, what do you see as the gravest threat to enfranchisement today? That it's pretty much uh, the ideology of, of uh, white supremacy, which is sort of the, the ideology that is the dominant ideology here in the United States. And, um, and, I, and I, you know, I would say at the local level uh, here in Washington, um, I, think, I think one of the things that sometimes we don't realize is how how hard it is to vote for people that don't speak English. Uh, I, I, you know, I think it kind of it's sort of a given for us that that, that speak the language. But uh, voting information to to individuals are, is is rarely offered in 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 their in their language that's not you know that's not in English. Um, the Voting Rights Act of, of 1965 uh, 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 was amended in '75 to include uh, language minorities, but um, to include language minorities. But I think I I I, I think it's um, that the, that it's often that a lot of counties don't um, 
that don't offer uh, voting material in a in language that is not English, even though they're they're required by law. So it's sort of um, it's sort of one of those things where where I, I see that as a as a sort of a, as a, a continuous threat to to uh, to the enfranchisement enfranchisement of, of, of people, of, uh, particularly in in, in Washington, uh, particularly uh, immigrants. Thank you so much. Chris, Christopher, what do you see as the greatest threat to enfranchisement right now? Well, I was gonna say what he said, <laughs> white supremacy. Um, let me uh, start off very briefly by saying, I mean, there's so much to discuss here, but let me start off by first by saying that um, I'm, I thank Western Washington for having one of my former students on the faculty, Christopher Jowler. Um, and uh, so he raves about you guys. So I wanted to get that off the table here. Um, so I will say um, white supremacy, um, but I would, I'll take a slight tack from what Marco said, and I, and I will say that voter suppression right now, um, and, you know, the all these laws on the books. I mean, in Texas, one can vote if one has a hunting license, but not, a, you know, but not a, a, a student ID, for example, right? And all, you know, and closing all these polling places, right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's clear what they're trying to do. Um, and white supremacy just drives all that. And if I may be so bold, I mean, I know I'm gonna to try to keep it clean, um, but it's just another example of these racist white people moving the goalposts once again, right? It's like, oh, they're getting too close. Let's move the goalposts again, right? And it's just, and it's, you know, and it's obvious what's happening right now. And, you know, I talk about this in, in a, a bunch of my, my current work, um, um, it is white supremacy, but I, there's this ideology that I describe theoretically, and I flesh it out in some of my some of my other work, you know, which I call it. It's, it's about status threat, right? Which is part of this larger theoretical framework of reactionary politics, right? And that's different from conservatives, right? Conservatives just by definition want to maintain the status quo. A reactionary actually wants to go backwards in time, um, and I think that's kind of what we're seeing right now. Um, you know, the more we take one or two steps you know, forward when it comes to racial progress, you best believe when we go back the other way, it's gonna be more than whatever those steps forward were, right? It happens all the time. Um, and we have this, I, okay, I know you got some people in your audience that probably like this fool. We got this idiot in the White House and I don't care. My name is Christopher Parker, University of Washington. Come find me if you have a problem with me saying this stuff. So you got this guy in the White House, right? Who is just doing everything he can you know, to reverse whatever gains that we had, right? And the fact of the matter is, is that much of what's happening right now, vis a -vis who we have in the White House, everything that's happening right now is a function of his predecessor, Barack Obama. When Obama got elected, you had a whole bunch of these folks that were saying like, uh-oh, right? <laughs> we got a black president now. Things have gone a little too far, right? So let's just back this up a little bit. And it, this is not confined to, to the franchise or the voter suppression, it spills over into all facets of American life. So anyway, the, the bad part about going last is, is that everybody else has said something interesting that I probably would have said. So I have a small little slice um, and I'll just say, yeah, what he, he, and she said, I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I will let you answer the next question first. <laughs> okay. um, and I think you, you started to take us there, right? So many of us watched last week's debate where near the end, President Trump raised concerns about voter fraud and then continued by encouraging his supporters to visit polling locations, to keep an eye out on malfeasance. Like he didn't use exactly that word, those words. What stands out to you when you hear that admonition? Well, you know what, it's, you know what it sounds like? I'm not a historian by training, but I know quite a bit about history. Um, and you know what it sounds like? It sounds like what was happening in the Jim Crow South um, back prior to the uh, ratification of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, where you would have these white people show up. I mean, I mean, it just varied, right, by, by state. But yeah, in some occasions, some places, one would have these white people, you know, that would show up, you know, at voter registration sites, right, often the courthouse, and they would harass Black people, sometimes even killing them, right? And so, so once again, as I was telling one of my students today or my, one of my classes, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And we saw the exact same thing happen historically uh, when it came to the Jim Crow South. Um, so, that, so it reminded me of that afresh. 
And, um, and that's, and, you know, and what's happening is, it's like, these people hear these dog whistles, right? We know what's going on. Go keep an eye on them, right? And um, so it, that can just lead no place good. Um, as a, it, it just, it, it just, it makes me so, it just makes me so angry that this stuff is coming back. And, you know, he's, it's not even like he's trying to hit at anything. You know, he's pretty bold in what he's saying. And so it, it, re, it reminds me of that and everything we had to go through in order to, I mean, we had to have the Voting Rights Act in 1965, right? There were, there were two other, there were two other, um, uh, pieces of legislation that preceded the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act. You had the Civil Rights Act in 1957 and the Civil Rights Act in 1960, right? But those had such weak enforcement mechanisms. I mean, it, it didn't really make it, it didn't put a dent in the problems when it came to voting rights. Other comments? Uh, what do we, what comes to mind when you hear talk of poll watchers, informal, I'm trying to remember the language that Trump is using. You know, so the election, the you know, militia out to to guard the vote or watch the vote. Well, I would just jump in and say, I mean, I think a, a couple things. I mean, one is, you know, one it just speaks to a massive historical transformation in our voting practices. So, in the 19th century, voting was a much more public um, sort of affair, in which, I mean, literally the candidates would pay. Uh, people to just beat up the, you know, the, 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 the voters for the opposing party and stuff like this. So it kind of, it echoes that, that history that was throughout the urban North. Um, of course, it echoes the, the post reconstruction South. And I mean, to, to think about voting in the post reconstruction South, Steve Hahn, a uh, historian, um, describes the, the voting process as paramilitary politics. So basically, if you were black, you know, you would roll up to the polls with your union league company in your uniform from having served in the union army, um, fully armed in order to be able to vote, right? And you would be opposed by some kind of white paramilitary, um, right? So it, it has echoes of that. But then I'd say the other thing is, it has very much this post 1970s NRA stand your ground, um, you know, liberal gun rights as a form of racial reaction um, rolled in with it, a way in which the state has outsourced its power to um, use force, lethal force, right? And it just, it has echoes of, uh, you know, Trayvon Martin being killed. I mean, even, even though that's not voting, it just has echoes of the way in which we enable uh, a certain classes of people to police others um, in their, you know, in their exercise of everyday life, but also in their exercise of their kind of citizenship rights and duties. And just going off of that too, you know, the first thing that really comes to my mind is this isn't surprising. This isn't anything new. And also for me, Trump is saying the quiet part out loud finally, um, which is good. Uh, quite frankly, black people, uh, brown people have been saying all of this has been happening for decades. And we have been told that it's not. We have been told that the state is not using its power to suppress us. And it's so clear now that it is that people don't have the choice to pretend like it's not happening. So in some way to me, it's a sigh of relief that it's so blatant. I hate that we've gotten to this place, but the fact that it's so blatant and people cannot deny it anymore uh, means that we're gonna have to finally start having conversations like this um, that are hard. Right. Um, yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to um, say, too, I think um, we can look back in history and, again, just like what uh, Professor Parker has been saying, this all leads back to white supremacy. And we as a country really need to come face to face and um, really understand that all of these democratic institutions that we love um, and that uphold American values were specifically written so that people like me would not be able to be fully enfranchised as a citizen. And if your basis of your democracy is built on disenfranchisement and subjugation, can it ever be truly pure and good in the way that we espouse it to be? So that leads to a question, right? About how does one, how does, 
one reconstruct, and I'm a bit mindful of those words, right? How does one reconstruct, or really how does one construct a democracy or a democratic-like system on the basis of those kinds of foundations? And, and, is, and, can, and, and is there any hope in trying to even imagine that? May I? Yes. Um, first of all, I totally agree with Bree. I mean, it's like, I've written many places, like, it's actually a good thing this fool got elected, right? Because it's so hard to cover this up now. You got exhibit A in the White House. Oh, racism's not a problem. Up, uh, 1600 Pennsylvania. Sexism is not a problem for real. Uh, the White House, right? So it's like, it's hard to cover this up now. It's, it's you know, because we have been, as Bree suggested, we have been gaslighted for so long, right? You know, people of color, women, now it's like, boom, here it is, right in your face, right? Now the question is, what are we gonna do about it? All right, and that's one of the reasons why I imagine that we're talking about the franchise right now, because that is the principal way that we get rid of folks like that. Um, so so what, I, what I will say is that, so is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, um, but given, the way the country is right now. I mean, so before, I mean, the right is all had already known that all these progressive forces were here, but these progressive white folks, they didn't really have much of a clue that these reactionary white folks were out there, right? They really <laughs> didn't. Now they do, right? And so now it doesn't really matter who wins in the short term. I, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, you know, in terms of policy, but in terms of where the country is right now, you know, in terms of this, you know, this inter-party, inter if you will, uh, or this intergroup to be more uh, specific, this intergroup animosity, this isn't going any place for a very long time, right? Because the scab has been, the bandaid has been ripped off. We all see each other now. And this animosity is going to be here for quite some time. Now, in the short term, do I think small d democracy, you know, is it is it a valid goal? Yes, yeah, a valid goal. Do I think it's gonna happen? Hell no not gonna happen, right? We can't even, <laughs> but you know what they say? You know, it's all saying, it's, got, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. So maybe we're reaching this inflection point right now, you know, the nadir of American democracy uh, before it returns, right? And let me just be get on record right now. I'm not trying to return to normal, whatever that was, because normalcy still had me being racially profiled. I have a PhD, I drive a Mercedes Benz. I still get racially profiled, right? I serve my country, right? Graduate, I went to the finest, I went to UCLA, University of Chicago. I've done every fucking thing I was supposed to do, right? Yet still, right? We can't go back to normal, right? I won't accept it and a whole lot of other people like me will not accept it, right? We gotta figure something else out. So if that means we're in the wilderness for a little while longer, I'm fine with that, right? But we can't go back to the status quo. Yeah, I, I I agree with the the other panelists. I think you know one of one of the things that uh that I've been thinking as I'm hearing other folks is that uh, I think most of us have to kind of accept the fact that that uh, white folks white folks as a collective I, and, and I'm and I'm not saying every single white person in in this country, but as, as as the majority of white folks in this country, right? I think I think I think it's pretty much a fact that the majority of white Americans voted for Donald Trump, right? And white people as a, the, as a collective, the white collective has, has historically wanted to maintain, um, they, want, they wanted to maintain certain privileges and rights only for themselves and did not want to extend it to other individuals, right? So the moment that, 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 that black folks wanted to have the same, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the black folks wanted to have the same rights that the constitution uh, was saying that they had, uh, that you, you saw, uh, you know, the sort of the reactionary politics that we saw in the, you know, in the, you know, you saw that in the, in the 19th century, uh, all the way, all the way up to the 19, all the way to the 1960s, right? So, so since the 60s, uh, we, I think, in the United States, we have this idea that that racism ended in the 60s with, you know, with with uh, the "I Have a Dream" speech, right? I think people say, oh, well, we had Dr. King and he fixed racism and everything is okay, right? I think that's sort of the idea that, that a lot of people have. And uh, to piggyback to uh, uh, as to what other folks were saying with the, with Donald Trump's election, I agree 100 percent. That uh, you know, a, I think I think we initially saw that with Ronald Reagan's election in the '80s, where it was a, it was a backlash to to a progressive 
uh, 60s and 70s. And, uh, and then we're seeing it again now with, with, with Donald Trump's election, right? So it's sort of this, uh, this pendulum that's moving back and forth that is, uh, that is, a, that is the, the, the reactionary pe uh, pendulum of American politics. I think, I think the, difference, the difference now, um, the diff I think the difference now is that there, aren't, there, there are, there are enough people of color and enough uh, white, uh, white liberals and progressives where they're the the right and the and the reactionary politics of of uh, the, of, of of the ultra right, right? Because I think I want to sort of make a distinction between uh, sort of the, the the traditional right and sort of the new the new right. Um, and it, you know, the there's there's enough people of color now and enough white progressives where they are no they're they're no longer able to win fair and square. Let's put it that way, right? Um, and 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 I, and I also want to say that. Um, that you know that in, it's kind of uh, you know also uh, kind of adds to what Dr. Parker was saying um, was that I think we haven't seen the worst of it, right? Uh, I think uh, I, I think it, I think things are going to get much worse, um, uh, and you know not 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 just in the coming weeks and the coming months, but in the coming years. Uh, I think I think when the when the ultra right gets to a point where they can no longer win elections, I think that's where we're, where we're really going to be able to, you know, I, I, maybe I'm just going to be, you know, maybe it'll be a little controversial and say that that might be a point to where we get to a civil war, right? Because if they're not able to, to win, uh, 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 no longer win elections, and they're extremely armed, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're extre extremely, extremely armed, and they're, you know, they're, they're, um, you know they 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 don't want the the franchise for other people that are not like them. I think we're going to get to a point to where they um, are, are are just you know are just going to say okay that's it um, you know we're you know we're you know enough with democracy. Uh, democracy was good as long as it just benefited us, and now that that you're using it uh, to your benefit to take away what we deem to be you know American and and you know and white and heterosexual and, and patriarchal. Uh, uh, we, 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 we ain't going to play that game. Right. And so I think, you know, I think, I, I think it's important for us to start to start thinking about that um, in, in those terms. Um, I think, you know, I, 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 in some ways, in some ways, I think I, in some ways I do, I, I do agree with folks that say that, you know, that, that Trump's election was able, it was, was good because it finally allowed a lot of uh, white folks that were more progressive to be able to, you know, to, you know, to be able to kind of see the country for what it is. I mean, this is America, right? It goes, it kind of goes to that song. This is America, right? And and I and I and I think we're we're finally able to see it, you know. And and uh, so, you know, I I, I want to thank all the other panelists for you know for their insight on on that. So I think an undercurrent of what I'm hearing here, right, is that you know, for a democratic system to survive, right, it, it's built on ultimately, a, you know. In many ways, it's a sort of trust, which itself is based on a myth of representation, right? That if I'm voting, that my vote is getting counted. If I if I show up at the ballot box, I'm going, my voice will be heard. And if I don't vote, that the people around me that are not voting are representing my interests. <clears throat> and we know, though, that the system is rigged. We know that, as Marco has said, people are not, you know, people aren't playing fair. Right. So I guess my next question is twofold. First of all, to people who might say, well, yes, that's true, but that's true in Florida or that's true in you know, Mississippi or I'm so glad I don't live in Alabama. You know, what can you tell us about what's happening in Washington state for those people who might say, you know, we're better than that because we ha have mail-in ballots. We have a system that, that works. Can I, I'll jump in real quick, if, if, if I may, uh, I think, because I think, that, you know, this is sort of something that I, you know, I, my, my, my the main focus in my research is Washington State, right? So I think it's important for me to kind of talk about Washington, because I think um, it, it goes to sort of with your question, right? Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I, that I, that I write in my research is, is how of the Voting Rights Act of 65 um, was, was something that was, um, that focused primarily on the South, right? Of course, it, it made sense to focus in the South. Uh, I mean, it was 1965. African Americans were the were the the largest minority in the United States at the time. Uh, Latinos were less than three percent of the population. Uh, at, at the same time, African Americans were you know were being lynched for being killed uh, for you know for sex exercising their you know their God given right to vote, right? And so it it made sense for for uh, for the Voting Rights Act to be focused on the South. Uh, about 99 percent of uh, all the statements that were taken 
uh, from uh, the from a civil, civil rights commission for the Voting Rights Act were in the South, right? It was almost like an, a, a thing exclusively for the South. Um, so one of so um, one of the things that happened after the Voting Rights Act of '65 was that um, the majority of the states that were not in the South were were, were deemed to be non-racist, right? And and one of those states was Washington. Um, at, at the time, there was you know there was a sizable Latino population in Eastern Washington, particularly in Yakima. Uh, and uh, they, you know, it, it, those those uh, those communities, because the 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 the, the Voting Rights Act initially uh, only covered, I want to say, 35 states, if I'm if I'm if I'm right, 35 or, or 37 states, wasn't uh, it, it didn't really it, it didn't include Washington, um, and so I think sometimes we have this idea that you know that that racism only happens in that only happens in the South, right, and so. In places in places like Yakima, and I think you see that even you know you said even in the last couple of years, what's happened is that that um, that you know that historically, uh, yeah, uh, you know even in Yakima, even after the Voting Rights Act was passed, um, people were still um, were were still giving literacy tests for for years. Like I want to say, like I, I think it was like like I want to say like eight years, seven or eight years after the Voting Rights Act passed, they were still giving literacy tests. Right. It wasn't until 1975, 1975, right, ten years later, where uh, um, where, where 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 people were, um, you know, if you didn't speak English, you couldn't vote. Right. That's when Washington State, right, in the 70s. Right. I'm not talking. This is not ancient history. Right. This is in the 70s. If you if you know if you didn't speak English and you weren't able to vote, right. And 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 so the in 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 the in, in 1970, I want to say 1973. Um, Yakima was forced to was was forced by um by by the by the by, by the attorney general to to ba to ba to basically um, allow allow people to vote that didn't speak English right and and they and they banned them from using literacy tests but they but they only you know they 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 um and then they they had them um after seventy five they had to include language minorities in in you know the Voting Rights Act was changed to include voting my, my, uh, language minorities in seventy five. And, it, and they only included uh, uh, pamphlets in in, uh, in Spanish for about you know for about six years and didn't do it again until 2002, right? So from the late 70s uh, until 2002, they didn't they didn't include Spanish uh, pamphlets when you had a, 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 an extremely large Latino population, especially with people that didn't speak English. So you know the, the, you know I'm talking you know from the 70s to 2002, uh, people that didn't speak the language were not able to vote because they couldn't. Um, because they they couldn't read their ballot, right? So this is you know this is 18 years ago, right? And and then you know and then Yakima just had a, a lawsuit in violation of the Civil Rights Act in 2012, right? So that's eight years ago, right? So I think you know uh, I think we 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 tend to think that it's something that happens outside of the South, but it happens here in Washington State. Absolutely, and I think your comments also point to the fact that barriers to voting are not always barriers. You know they don't. Getting the ballot is not the be all and end all when it comes to getting access to the vote. Right? There are other, other, you know, other pieces that maybe, um, in some ways, harder to detect. Bree, have you encountered in your own either your advocacy work and your work in the Attorney General's office other either barriers to, to voting or promising strategies to expand or address those barriers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I worked at the legislature for five years um, in both the House and the Senate as caucus staff for Democrats. And during that time, uh, there was not a Black senator. We have not had a Black senator in Washington State since 2006 uh, when Rosa Franklin retired. Um, during the time that I was at the Senate was the time that we got the first Latina Senator in Washington state history, the first South Asian Senator in Washington state history, which is great, but that again shows if we're breaking those barriers in uh, 2016, 2017, that's still showing that there is a barrier for a truly representative democracy where the people that are serving at the legislature and on city councils or on county councils actually represent the populations that they are supposed to represent. 
Um, a huge problem that we're seeing in Washington state is uh, at large voting, at large county voting that is happening, particularly in Eastern Washington. There are six state, or there are six counties in Eastern Washington that have more than 60% um, Latino representation and they have no Latino serving on county councils. Um, Dulce Gutierrez is the only Latina on the Yakima City Council, which is a city that's majority Latino. So we are seeing that, you know, it's not just like what you were saying, um, it's not just about having access to the ballot, it's about the fair representation of um, access and who is like representing us once they get elected into office. And so in Washington state, something that has happened is the uh, Washington Voting Rights Act, which actually is trying to prohibit at-large voting, uh, at-large county voting that got passed in um, 2018. Uh, I think my understanding is that Yakima County has sued over that. Um, and so that's currently in litigation. Something else that I encountered when I was at the legislature in a fix that we were trying to come up with uh, is for tribal members. Um, there was a huge issue in 2018, I don't know if folks saw, but in South Dakota, which is a huge population of um, the Native community, they told them that they couldn't use their tribal IDs um, to register to vote. We had that same thing, and knowing to us, we had that exact same thing in Washington State up until 2018. Um, and as a state that has so much tribal representation, um, just in the Northwest in general, it's shameful that stuff like that is even happening. So again, I think that there is just this narrative and um, throughout history in our country that, you know, we've made so much progress, things are going so well. We stopped all of that progress really in the, the late seventies and we have just completely like blinded ourselves and been like, okay, everything is fixed, everything is solved. Once again, it leads back to white supremacy, it leads back to racism. For me, I always think it all comes back to, we have a very set prescribed idea in this nation of what it looks like to be racist. We think that you have to be somebody that's in the KKK, you're riding on a horse, you're burning the crosses. And if you're not doing that, we don't have a problem. But it, that is not the problem. The problem is just the nefarious systemic ways, again, that are built into these institutions, literally built into them to make sure that people like me are not able to fully participate in our democracy. Absolutely. Can, can I say something to what uh, Maria Markle just said? Um, so, um, so I used to run a survey research lab here at UW when we had one, and we used to run a Washington poll every year. And um, I published a piece in Crosscut I want to say, in 2016 where I compared, you know, King County, you know, to Eastern Washington, because a lot of people say, oh, Seattle, we're really progressive, right? <laughs> progressive when it comes to Sierra Club, right? The environment, right? But when it comes to race and racism, oh, hell no, right? So what I found on various measures of racism, that King County was maybe two or three percentage points, maybe a little more progressive than Eastern Washington, right? But two or three percentage points, that's within the margin of error. So you know what that means? No real difference. This is maybe yeah. not Washington specific, but sort of a national problem that I think is worth highlighting, which is, I mean, class differences are incredibly influential in, um, I mean, representation. If you look at our legislatures, I mean, it's, highly unusual to find anyone who is not college educated, despite the fact that not a majority of adults are college educated. Um, but really, if you look at voter participation, right, what is much more striking is educational attainment and its correlation with voter participation. You find much greater differences than you do, for example, with race. So just to give you uh, some, some brief numbers, in 1964, 59% of people with ninth grade educations or less voted. In 2018, 14% of people with ninth grade education or less voted, right? And, and you know, the differences between people who have college education and people who have high school or less are so dramatic. You have people with college education voting at three to four times the rate of people with high school or less, right? And this, yeah, sorry, jump in, Christopher. Yeah, so I hear what you're saying on that, right? But let me just make one quick point. like. Race over determines class, 
Let's yes. just get that straight right now, right? First of all. Second of all, if you control for class, right? That is to say, if you get two people and they're both, you know, one person is, okay, you get two people and they both have high school educations, right? But the only difference is, is one is black and one is white. That white person is going to have more access to the ballot than the black person, right? Definitely. It's just a fact, right? Yeah, no doubt so about I just it. Wanna, I get, I'm not, I'm not gain saying what you're saying about class, but let's, yeah, let's keep yeah, it. No, the, I mean, these, you know, I, I was just looking for this today and I couldn't come up with, you know, more regressed numbers. Um, it's just merely to say, like, um, there's clearly a, uh, there's a there's a hole in our democratic participation and in representation that is definitely overdetermined uh, by race, but it is also structured by class. And I think we can look at the way that this correlates with all sorts of other aspects of American life, like mass incarceration. Right? I mean, we know there's you know at any level of education, you are much more likely to be incarcerated if you are black. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But since the 1970s, white people with high school or less, their rates of incarceration have skyrocketed, right? And so this, I think there's just this, uh, there's this way in which our, you know, if we look at our economic recovery that we're undergoing, the K-shaped recovery, right? We see this bifurcation, um, which, is, you know, is disproportionately affecting people of color um, but also has class ramifications that spill out across racial boundaries. Um, and it's, you know, it, it is, um, it goes to how campaigns are run. It goes to all sorts of ways in which participation um, in our society is, you know, structured by these kind of fundamental categories. So can I just push back just for a second or yeah, just please. add some context? So let me tell you why I have this reaction when it comes to class. It's not to say that class isn't salient because it is as a, as a category, as a category of oppression, but you know, the whole Bernie bro like this whole sort of, you know, prioritizing class over race. I'm not saying you're doing this, right? I'm just saying for anybody who wants to say, you know, we can probably achieve some success, right? Some a more egalitarian society if we stress class instead of race. And, 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 I could see why that would be important because you're going to get more people to across the generally across the racial categories, right? To but especially white people to a group to a to a approve a class-based solution to oppression than a race-based solution to oppression. Understand that, right? But there's a reason why the, these these class alliances that cross race don't ever really work, right? And I'll tell you what, and I know it's going to make some people mad, but I don't care right? Working class white people are the most racist white people. And let me tell you why they're the most racist, because they're in the most precarious position, right? So this investment in whiteness only goes so far, right? And so when black people start catching up, right, it's a problem. Or Latinos start catching up, it's a problem, right? So they're in the most precarious position. That's why they're the most racist, right? And so any sort of interracial uh, alliance that's based on class, I'm telling you right now, there's a reason why it's never worked, right? Because working class white people are relatively racist, right? All I got to say. Can I, can I add to that, uh, uh, Professor Parker? I think, I mean, I, you know, I think when you know you're saying that, uh, I agree with you. And I think it kind of loses back to sort of something the Bois was able to point out, right? The, the Bois was able to point out uh, very early in the 20th century, right? Where he, where he, where he sort of, he looks at the way that, um, that, you know, that, that, that white people are, that, you know, that white people are reacting to, to sort of the progress that black people are, are, are making in the early 20th century, right? And, and I, and I, you know, and I, and I, so I, I, I that's why I kind of jump on, want to jump on this conversation because I do think, um, it's 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 an important one to have because um, it's it's uh, in some ways right what what's, what I mean, in some ways what we're seeing right is that 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 rich white people or wealthy white people or upper class white people whatever you want to call it um, you know in some ways have given white people this sort of uh, this this white privilege right that even though even though they might be poor at least they're white right. And, 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 and poor white people know that, right? They, they, they know that, you know, that I might be a poor white person, but I'm not black, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not black. So because of, you know, so I might be poor, but, I, but I, at least I'm not that guy, right? So, you know, so I think, you know, so it's sort of this, this idea of these, uh, these wages of whiteness, right? I, as a white person, I get, I get, I get paid 
for for being white even though I'm poor, right? And how does that work, right? Well, it goes, it, it, it happens on a, on, a, on a sort of in a regular, like in your regular life, right? You go into a store, you don't get followed around, right? That's, you're getting paid right there, boom. I, I, I'm a white person, I go into a store, store, go to the grocery store, they're, they're not following me, right? I, I, I'm driving by, there's a cop. Uh, is he gonna look at me? Is he gonna pull me over? No, nope, I'm white. I'm poor, but he's not gonna. He's not gonna do that. He's not gonna. He's not gonna pull me over, right? Boom! I get paid again, right? So I think what, what you know. So you know. So these are sort of examples on a, on on a daily basis that you know that you're experiencing as a as a poor white person, and 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 and. But the ones that the, the people that benefit most from that are the are are the wealthy white people, right? Because because poor white people are sort of used as that sort of uh, buffer. Uh, that to where we're, you know, we're not able to get to them, right? And so, and, and, and but, uh, but uh, poor white people are okay with being that, that buffer, right? They're okay with being that buffer because at the, at the end of the day, uh, they're not black, which is, you know, which, which, which to them is the, you know, is, is sort of the bottom of the racial hierarchy, right? Well, at, at least, you know, even though, you know, even though I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm poor, uh, I don't have these other uh, class privileges at the end of the day, I'm still white. And so therefore it, 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 it awards me these particular privileges, right? I think, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, a, it's like if you, you know, sometimes you come across white, a white person, but you know, if they, you know, if they, you know, I, you know, for me, like I'll always be, you know, I'll always be brown, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, sort of like where I've been or, you know, this, whatever education I've gotten, it, it, it won't matter, you know, when I, when I'm in certain places, right? But um, for, for, for a white person, uh, you know, they, you know, they, the, the fact that they're white gives them, you know, this, 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 uh, this sort of, this sort of advantage in society, um, you know, and, 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 you know, and I'll even take it a little further. I think, you know, one of the things that we don't realize is that there's a, there's a lot of research that shows that, um, that, that white Americans with low education are often given more, more advantages in societies than people of color with higher education. Right. And, and that's and, and, and that's that's sociologically proven as a fact. Right. You could be you know, you could be you know, you could be like you could be Latino, you could be black and you submit a, a resume, you know, with the B.A. or a master's or Ph.D. And you could be a white person, you know, that submits a, you know, a, a resume with the high school diploma. Your name is John Smith. And this guy's name is Marco Morales. Well, you know, the person looking at the resume, you know, usually a white person will say, well, I want to work with John Smith. I don't want to work with Marco Morales. So I'm going to give John Smith this, you know, this, this, uh, this advantage in this hiring process. And so I think it's just one of the ways that I think that it's important to, you know, to, to talk both about race and class. I think they're more important, but I think it's important to make the distinctions about how they operate in different spheres. I'm mindful of our time. And in just a couple of minutes, we're going to, Turn it off. Turn it over to the audience. So I'm pleased to see that we have some questions starting to pop, pop up. I'd like to bring us a little bit back to voting, but at the same time thinking about a lot of the strands that have been expressed so far. So, as Jill said right at the outset, this 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 panel series was spurred in recognition of the centennial of the 19th Amendment, and the 19th Amendment we can celebrate because it brought down a certain formal barrier to voting access, even as we know that, first of all, you know, that was very incomplete because access to the ballot was stratified by race um, for, for decades to come after that. We also know that in the year after the 19th Amendment, even among white women, the voting rate was much lower than it was among white men. So I'd love to hear some perspectives about what we see as kind of broader informal barriers to the ballot and or informal levers that we can use to um, bring more people into the sphere. We know, for example, today that voting rates vary demographically. African-American women in recent elections have voted at higher rates than white women, than African-American men. So you know, what do we know about information? What do we know about these other social factors that shape who ends up at the ballot box and who doesn't. Bri, I see you wanna jump in and I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, um, so for me, I have spent a lot of my career in the electoral spaces, right? And the entire, our entire political apparatus, um, electoral apparatus is really built around the narrative of cisgendered middle-class white men. Uh, narrative that campaigns have for messaging, for getting out the vote, for registering people to vote is built around 
um, cisgendered white men. I, when I graduated, I graduated from Western, by the way, I'm a Western alum too, but um, I came out of the political science department and I actually became a political data analyst. And so I worked a lot with political data. Um, I was the only black woman in the entire country that was doing that work. So again, that's not a formal barrier, but it's an informal barrier. I was, when I worked at the legislature, I was the only black person that worked for any of the four caucuses as like doing policy or communications. Again, that's not a formal barrier, informal, but those are the people that are making the decisions too, right? Like I always joke um, after working in campaigns for so long, I can take a look at a campaign and see if they have a single black person on staff because of the way that they are targeting and messaging black people. It's usually not. And you have, I think that so much of this problem that I'm seeing within my own party, I know that this is nonpartisan, but I am part of like the democratic establishment, right? We are feeling and seeing such a huge problem because the democratic leadership is still mostly white, mostly boomer, um, mostly millionaires and billionaires. And the people that win Democrats elections look like me. And so there is a huge disconnect between like what the people that are supposed to be voting for you are feeling versus what you are seeing because you are just so far removed from that world. Like you don't understand. And part of me gets that, right? It's just like, we all don't understand each other's experiences as race, gender, class, whatever. But if we're not even willing to have put those people into positions of power, we're never going to start that understanding and start creating like a truly representative democracy. So like, it's not just about race. It's not just about class. It's like about, to me, it's about opportunities and creating ways for people that have been historically left out of the political process and bringing them in at all levels. Um, I also used to say all the time too, like most senators, most elected officials, staff are the ones that are writing those bills. <laughs> We're the ones that are doing the research. We're the ones that are drafting the legislation. Um, and if your staff is all white, if you only have one black person that's worked at the Washington State Legislature uh, for a political caucus in the last decade, you're not getting that perspective. And those people aren't feeling seen, they aren't feeling heard. So you're either disconnecting um, completely or when somebody even does try to engage you, it's like, why should I believe you? And so that's a, a thing too, is like really investing in grassroots organizations that are doing this work. There are BIPOC led organizations all over Washington state that are doing amazing work to really get out into communities that are underserved and underrepresented and bring them into the fold. But the wider public does not know that. Elected officials do not know that. Those um, organizations are not the ones getting money. Um, so again, it's to me, we start changing this by bringing people into the fold, providing opportunities. And that's really how we're gonna start addressing some of these barriers. And what I hear when you say bringing people into the fold, it's bringing people, but it's bringing institutions and organizations into the fold. Absolutely. As well. What advice would you give to someone who said, hey, I wanna be supportive. I want to be engaged in these efforts, but I don't know, I don't know where to look. <laughs> um, I mean, Google, <laughs> you can, I think we're at the point, right? Like where, again, like race and class and ethnicity, this is just in the lexicon of like the general public now. I have never seen people so politically engaged. Like I have friends call me, text me that I haven't talked to in years being like, how do I vote? Who should I vote for? Can you like call me? Can we like go through this? And so we're at a moment where like the information is out there. And the reason, uh, the reason why I say Google too is because a lot of times the burden of education falls onto the shoulders of black and brown people. Absolutely. And it is not our responsibility to educate white people about how not to be racist at this point. Right. So that Google is your friend. You can also email me. I'll put my email <laughs> in uh, the chat. You can feel free to email me too. So we had a few questions um, about 
you know, what, how do we make, you know, given the importance of representation, given, given the importance of people seeing people that look like them, people who have their own, who ha share background experiences in, in politics, and this is not just to breathe, this is to, you know, anyone who'd like to venture it, what do we make of Kamala Harris as a vice presidential candidate? How does that, you know, does that change anything, essentially? And there's, I'm, here I'm pulling from a couple different questions. Well, uh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, you go ahead. Well, I honestly, to me, um, I mean, I think, I think, I think representation matters. So I'm not going to dismiss it as, you know, okay, like this is, you know, this is whatever. I think that's, I think that's good. I mean, I think, I think representation is important. Uh, I think for me, I'm more, I'm more, uh, I'm more interested in structural change and, and not so much as to who the person that occupies the office is, right. As, as an individual, right. Uh, the same way that I, that I didn't really, I mean, I, 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 I initially, I, you know, I, I thought it was, you know, I thought, I, I thought it was amazing that Obama got elected the, you know, the first time. Um, I think the second time, you know, I was still, uh, that was, that was good, but I was more concerned with sort of the policies that, you know, that he was, you know, that he was going to implement or was Im implementing. And so I, 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 I for, for, for me, I look at, um, I look at the positions as more of a, of a means to an end, right? Like, how can we, how can we use those, those, those offices to, you know, to make, to make the country as much, uh, as much equitable as possible, right? Not, not so much as who occupies it, right? Because I think, you know, I, I, if the person is terrible and they're a person of color, then it gives people ammunition to say, well, we got a black person in the White House or we got, you know, a woman, or we got, you know, whatever, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, for me, it's like, well, if, if like, I, like if, is, is that black person, is that Latino, is that native person gonna do more for the communities that elected them, right? I'm more concerned with that and was sort of like, what is it that they're gonna be doing versus like who the face is that is, um, that is, that is it's sitting in the office. Right. So that's 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 the way that I that I perceive it. Yeah. And just to go off of that, you know, for me, when I think about representative democracy, it's about equitable representation, too, where in an ideal world, the um, people that we elect are accountable to the communities that they serve. And so, I mean, in practice, that looks like electing people that come from community organizing backgrounds, people that come from backgrounds that are not traditionally represented um, in elected office. I mean, even if we can talk about class, you have to be independently wealthy to run and win office. Um, you know, the legislature uh, to be a state senator, it's a part-time job. It's not a part-time job. It's a full year round job. It's $35,000 and you're gone away from your home and your kids for four to six months down in Olympia out of the year. Who can make those kind of sacrifices? Who has that money to supplement their own income? Um, they're usually, again, back to like what I was saying around the narrative, uh, older cisgendered white men. Um, going back to your question about Kamala, you know, I, I remember I was joking last year before all of the campaigning even started, I was like, man, it's going to be Joe Biden and Kamal Harris. I already know. Just because the way that it looks on paper and appeals to people, I think it's amazing having a, a Black woman um, being elevated to that level. It was a huge deal for me having somebody from historically Black college. That is a huge deal having somebody elevated uh, to that level. But again, it's about accountability. Um, and really showing that, you know, you are going into these positions to represent com your community, represent communities that you serve um, and making sure that you are accountable to them. So I'm excited. Um, I think it's a good ticket. I think it's a, a strong ticket. Uh, and it, but again, at the same time, I don't think that it was a quote unquote like risky move for him to do. I think it's a strategic thing um, to pick her. I'm going to try to bring in some other audience questions. There's a series of questions that deal with sort of structure, structural barriers, structural element, institutional elements of the American system that lead to disproportionate influence. So gerrymandering, the electoral college um, question, and I think how these intersect with partisanship as well. So, so two kind of related questions, and I'm going to open the floor to any members of the panel to jump in. First of all, 
given that those institutional barriers exist, are there ways and to the extent that one party seems to be better at using them than others, are there ways in which, you know, to use the language of the of the questioner, can the Democrats get better at using some of these institutional tools? A related question is how do we distinguish between kind of partisan efforts at voter, su voter suppression and racist efforts at voter suppression? And does that distinction even matter? You know, is that a meaningful distinction to make? I, I'll take the I'll take the second question. Okay, go for I'll it. Answer the first one too, but I don't want to hog up time. So the second question is: It possible to distinguish between partisan motives and racist motives? Woo. Um, Technically, yes, practically no. Um, <laughs> so um, they're so highly correlated. There's this thing, not to throw too much jargon around out here, there's this thing called effective polarization. Um, that's really about, you know, partisans like literally hate, you know, the uh, um, their counterparts. They just literally hate each other. Um, and this and this and this hate or dislike or disdain. You know, usually tracks along three interrelated dimensions: uh, religion, race, class. Right now, recent work, like like it didn't surprise me, that shows that race is the most important of these cleavages. Right, so it's really impossible to distinguish, to distinguish between partisanship and race. And when you think about, like, why do a lot of white people, you know, support the Republican Party? Well, a lot of it's based on racism, right, and nativism. That attracts them to the Republican Party. So you can, it's really hard to distinguish these two things. As a matter of fact, we can go back to 1964, the 64 race, where you start having these cleavages start taking place along racial lines, right? So you have President Johnson, who declared the Democrat Party to be the party of racial progress. Goldwater, oh, okay, well, I'll make the Republican Party the party of racial regress, right? And, and off we went to the races. So ever since then, it's, it's really hard to distinguish race from party ID because they're so intertwined. I would say too to that, um, there's only one party that is currently and actively engaging in racism. Um, I get, as a partisan person, it's frustrating to me when I see um, the narrative framed as this is an issue that is happening on both sides and to me it's just blatantly not at this point and that needs to just be directly called out um you know as we've been having this conversation i've really been thinking about the fact that this country is in a uh demographic shift that we haven't seen in centuries there is a group called the rising american electorate uh, that is going to compromise the majority of uh, eligible voters and they're people under the age of 35 uh, that are people of color. Um, and what we are seeing right now is a power grab by a small majority who represents about 30% of this country. They understand that the demographics are shifting. They are understanding that if we have a truly fair and free elections, that doesn't look like them winning anymore. And so they are trying to hold on and grab power by any means necessary literally by any means necessary. Um, yeah. And they are doing it and they're flexing their muscles. And Democrats um, have traditionally not wanted to do that because of the belief in the way that our political system should work. Um, but the problem really is the fact that Democrats, a lot of times we see Republicans as um, people that we might not agree with, but we can eventually we can meet in the middle with consensus, right? Bipartisanship, we love it. We love talking about it. Republicans see us as adversaries and there is not this understanding from us that they see us as adversaries and that they will do whatever that they need to do to um, make sure that they control and maintain power. To the question about the electoral college, uh, the electoral college was built out of slavery. It's a racist system. Um, it was literally during the Constitutional Convention, it was a agreement um, to make sure that there was representation, proportional representation for the millions of slaves that we had because we weren't counted as citizens, but they still wanted some kind of electoral power. I mean, there is a movement right now about a Constitutional Convention 
uh, which is the easiest way really to get rid of the electoral college that opens a whole other kind of terrifying can of worms if we have a constitutional convention we've never had one before we've also never had a president try to blatantly and openly steal an election so and i, I think will leave that leave it at that <laughs> and i think it's important to recognize too going back i mean part of what chris was talking about a couple minutes ago this notion of effective polarization right if one party if either both parties hate each other, right? Or what I'm hearing from you, Brie, is if you know one party hates the other party and the other party is trying to figure out a way to give that party a hug, you're not going to have effective politics. Right. I think we also have to ask, you know, whether we would have an effective constitutional convention at a moment when we can barely bear to be in the same room with one another. Right, and that's why it's the the dangerousness over um, a constitutional convention. You know, I think what you just raised goes back to kind of what I've been really trying to speak to is the the disconnect between um, the two parties. We have one party that is a hegemony. We have literally the Republicans; they are white men. And they have completely centered themselves around being white men. Democrats, we are the uh, big tent coalition. We are the party that's supposed to have people of color, progressive whites, women, but still we are seeing that the people who are leading the party, the people that have the most electoral power in the party have more in common with the Republicans on the other side than they do with somebody like me who represents their base. So we have a number of questions that are trying to look for lessons um, and particularly, you know, some questions, you know, are there historical periods that we can look to that look like ones that we are currently embodying? Are there other countries that have gone through similar kinds of shifts in, in their demographics, certain kinds of power, similar kinds of power struggles? I'm wondering, Peter or, or anyone in the audience, are, is there anything you can point us to say, hey, this is, we've been here before, or maybe we haven't quite been here before, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we can say we've been here before, but we can recognize the contingency and structural obstacles that others have faced. So, you know, the Republican Party, not, not today's Republican Party, but the old GOP doesn't exist in 1854. In 1860, it wins a presidential election with a plurality of the vote. Um, and then, you know, I mean, whatever you want to say about uh, the Civil War, the North does invade the South and force uh, military reconstruction on the South in the mid 1860s. Um, black suffrage becomes a dominant position within the Republican Party by 1868. Um, so certainly there's, uh, you know, it's hard to predict future equilibria, I think. Um, you know, I think we could say the same thing about the civil rights movement. I mean, there's no, there's no sense in 1959 that, you know, by, uh, you know, June of 1960s, there's going to have been hundreds of sit-ins across the country and the birth of a militant um, student movement that will, you know, shake the foundations of Jim Crow. The, you know, it, it's really hard, I think, to, to predict um, how structural obstacles uh, will be overcome. You know, obviously some features of our political system just because of, uh, not only because of their history, but because of the unique um, transformations of the, the geography of our country are, are extremely potent. Um, and it's extremely hard to like overcome the Senate. Um, but I, I guess a hopeful lesson in this moment, and I think a hopeful lesson from those earlier moments, if we think of the New Deal, we think of the Civil Rights Coalition, we think of the Radical Republicans. I mean, people had to assemble a majority and then not really give uh, too much of a hoot about what the opponent, uh, what the opponent thought about uh, the progressive changes. Um, and I think Democrats have to have a more ruthless um, sensibility about creating institutions that will endure and allow change to endure. I mean, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was one of these things where, I mean, they said, no, we are gonna clamp this down on nine states. We are gonna put this pre-clearance mechanism on you and it is gonna be like a viper on your neck until you let black people vote. Uh, 
And it took that kind of mechanism and it's been the destruction of that mechanism post 2013 um, in Shelby County, County versus Holder that has allowed this um, resurgence of all of these, these atrocious uh, mechanisms, right? So Democrats have to recognize that what they need are kind of counter structural um, mechanisms and that you cannot do like Obama did in 2008 and, you know, offer your opponent's negotiating position as your, your first uh, step out of the gate. You have to seize the moment if Biden is able to win a decent majority and win the Senate. I mean, it's, I think it's a, a do or die moment personally. So can, can I just jump in here for a moment? So I, I can talk about the sort of uh, social psychological, political psychological mechanism behind this. So generally the right runs on negative affect, that is to say fear, anger, anxiety, right? And those, it's, it's so much easier to mobilize on that basis. But beyond that, if you think about the cognitive psychology literature, people are more sensitive to losses than they are to gains. So if white people feel like, oh shit, we're losing our country, it's gonna be a whole lot easier to mobilize them, right? Than people that are going after hope, right? It's just not, it's, it's a huge difference. And so that's what permits the right to be able, regardless of what we might think of them as a party, or we might think of uh, their policies, I have to give them credit. It's like, okay, look, you know, they figure out what they're going to do, they toe the line, and they march, right? Democrats is always about process, right? Democrats need to I think we're, the, the party is finally getting to a point in which they're being motivated by fear and anxiety and anger, right? I, I can show some, show some of that stuff in my research, right? Um, and independents are too. So if you, if you hit an independent with a frame like, okay, Trump is a threat to the working class, right? Nothing. If you hit them with a the frame like Trump is a, an existential threat to democracy, boom, right? Mobilization takes off. For Democrats, it doesn't matter what you hit them with. They're they're scared, they're anxious, and they're angry, right? I mean, look at the massive turnout that we're seeing right now when it comes to early voting, right? Because they don't trust the USPS, right? These lines, you know, that are all over the place in, in Ohio, for example, right? So I guess Democrats are, have finally gotten the memo. You got a bully in the White House right now. They see him, right? And they want to do anything they can to get him out. And one of the things that Tyler and I did, the, uh, my student who was at Western, who's now at Cal State uh, Sacramento, what we showed is that if you hit black people with a frame that Trump is a threat to the race, turn them out. If you hit them with a working class frame, nothing, right? So it's really about this sense of existential threat. Like the Republicans generally feel, or the people on the right, they feel like they're under constant threat from people of color, from feminists, right? from from immigrants from brown countries right that turns them out all the time i am so sorry to do this but i am looking at the clock and we are running out of time so i want to thank everyone for a really wide-ranging conversation i want to thank those of you who submitted questions on the q a i hope we did justice to at least some of those questions and i want to remind everyone that regardless of the partisan or nonpartisan nature of the League of Women Voters, I think we all agree on the importance of voting, the importance of getting those around you to be engaged in the political process. So I wanna thank our panelists and I'll turn it back to you, Jill. Hi. Well, um, uh, Jill told me that there would be a second here at the end when I might just uh, give a heads up to the fact that the, the Monroe Institute is very busy this fall because these uh, panels, as you've heard, were rescheduled from the springtime and then in three weeks, we have our annual uh, Monroe seminar, which this year is gonna be, uh, the theme is uh, Washington State uh, Politics in the Time of COVID-19. And um, headlining the program will be our keynote conversation. We decided not to have one person just lecture to people for an hour, but it'll be a keynote conversation mm -hmm. moderated by myself um, between uh, Professor Alastair Roberts of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, who's the uh, director of the Public Policy uh, Institute there, and Professor uh, Kyle um, Harper from uh, University of Oklahoma, Professor uh, of Classics and, and Letters. Um, Harper ha has written um, 
uh, um, about um, the institutions of the Roman Empire and, and pandemics and, that's, uh, and so forth at that time and is writing a book on the history of, of pandemics right now. And, and uh, Roberts um, is a person who thinks that um, we need to rethink uh, the downsizing of government in the neoliberal era in light of uh, a series of crises like 9-11, the 2008 uh, recession, and now the present situation. So there's going to be a difference of opinion, I think, about institutions and how they operate there that uh, I'll hopefully be able to moderate. And then our other two panels, very quickly, are on um, the, the impact of COVID-19 in the Latinx population in this state. And um, the um, the impact of, of the, the pandemic on our bureaucratic uh, institutions and agencies. And uh, prof uh, Professor Dester will be moderating that panel as well. And another colleague, Rudy Alamillo, will be moderating the panel on um, the Latinx population in the state. And I know that if Jill's somewhere, she's telling me, all, all right, enough of you, Johnson. But I want <laughs> that that's October 27th and 28th folks, and uh, as soon as we're done with these programs, a big splash about that will uh, be coming out uh, for your scrutiny. Um, and I don't know if Jill's going to be there, but I'm done. Thank you very much for, uh, thank, thank, thank all of you very much for a very enlightening evening. Hello, and uh, I want to just say thank you to all of our speakers. Can you all hear me now? Yes. yes. Wonderful. This was a, a conversation that went deeper and was uh, more informative than I could have ever hoped for. And I thought all four of our panelists were outstanding. I'm just deeply grateful to all of you. I hope the whole of the audience got as much out of this as I did. There were fresh ideas this evening and new ways of looking at things that I will be carrying with me for a long time. The League hopes that you will also remember that one of our partners in this is the Watkin Museum. And if you look at their website, they've got tremendous programming coming up on this topic and other mm -hmm. things related to uh, civic engagement as well as our culture. And, and the Watkin Museum hopes that you will check out their offerings. When you look at the League of Women Voters website, you will also see that we have candidate forums coming up. Uh, we have lots of opportunities about ways that you can engage in the vote and, and ways that you can help work to get your community uh, registered to vote. There's still time in Washington to do this. But most of all, we hope that you will join us again next Tuesday from 7 until 8.30. The topic of next Tuesday's conversation will be making our voices heard beyond voting. What can we do to enhance political voice for all? We're really explored tonight problems. Next week, we're gonna be looking at solutions and we'll be joined by outstanding panelists, um, Dr. Melina Juarez, who's the assistant professor at the Department of Political Science up at Western and Dr. Larry Estrada, who is an associate professor emeritus at Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies Sahar Fati, who is the policy director for Washington State Office of the Attorney General, and Julie Johnson, who is an enrolled member of the Lummi Nation and a co-chair of Native Vote uh, for the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest uh, Indians. I'm going to tell you that as great as tonight was, I expect that next week will also be an outstanding way to uh, um, engage in this conversation and thank you all for attending and uh, thank you to the Monroe Institute uh, for civic engagement for being our, our partner in all of this and so thank you and uh, good evening. <laughs>